Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Um, so, yes, this can be mathematical view of voting systems. So, the great thing about uh, maths is that it gives you this really precise language uh, that we can express things in. So, we can write statements that have that are that have no ambiguity, um, which is different from normal speech. So, in normal speech, you might say, "Oh, the voting system isn't fair," but that could have various different meanings. Um, but we can actually apply specific, precise, unambiguous maths language um, to voting systems, and we can make definitions, prove theorems, uh, provide examples and counterexamples, and do all of that um, to show stuff about voting systems. So an electorate is defined as a set of voters, and voters have transitive preferences. So if voter uh, so transitive means if a voter prefers X to Y and prefers Y to Z, then they must prefer X to Z. Um, but even though all the people in the electorate um, have transitive preferences, it doesn't mean that the electorate overall will have transitive preferences. So the table there gives you an example of one where it, there aren't transitive preferences. Uh, two people prefer X to Y, two people prefer Y to Z, and two people f prefer Z to X. So there's no way that, there's no resolution here in, of making a transitive preference system that pleases everyone. Um, so a voting system is just defined as an algorithm. So it takes in a set of N, so suppose there's N voters, it takes in their preferences, does some computation and outputs um, a ranking of the candidates. Um, so formally, if you have a set of n possible rankings of candidates, the algorithm is a function that outputs just a single ranking of candidates from them. So for example, first past the post is the simplest one. Any, any preferences except for first preferences are just ignored. So you, you're, the voters only allowed to give their first preference, and whichever of the first preferences is most popular just wins straight away. So that's an example of the, probably the simplest voting system. Um, so if there are exactly two candidates in an election, there is good news provided by May's theorem. Um, so suppose we want a voting system, there's two candidates, and we want every voter to have the same influence. Um, so on the screen, I've that have a way of expressing this in precise mathematical language. Um, so each vote has the same influence. The winning conditions are identical for both candidates. So for example, if one candidate needed 60% of the vote to win, that wouldn't be at the same condition for both candidates. And if C2 is not more popular than C1, if candidate two is not more popular than candidate one, and then candidate one becomes more popular, candidate one must still win. So these are three fairly straightforward, fairly like minimal requirements for a voting system. And May's theorem says first past the post um, where everyone just votes for which is their favorite or abstains if they're indifferent between them. And then you go with whichever is the most popular. That is the only system that satisfies all these criteria. Um, so that's, that's the good news. Um, and so a brief side look at changing the status quo when there are kind of two candidates, but also kind of aren't two candidates. So suppose there's, mul suppose there's multiple alternatives to the status quo. So for example, if um, you wanted to say, should we change the national anthem or something, you might say, well, maybe, but it depends what we're gonna change it to. Um, so you might say, yeah, I'm, not in, I'm not too unhappy about changing it, but it would, there would have to be a good alternative anthem. Um, so the obvious problem with, this, with just having a should we change it or not problem is that, let's say, just under a majority of people could favor staying with the status quo, and the status quo could be any alternative in a one-on-one -on -one competition, but it could still lose if, every, if, um, if we just have a simple should we change or not. Um, and so after the, after we've, after the states, after we move to the alternative and then choose which of the alternatives we want, there could be a majority who are saying, actually, I would have rather we just stayed with the original one. So the solution is similar to uh, New Zealand's referendum on changing their flag in that they had 
a, uh, they had a vote first on what the alternative flag should be and then put it up against the current flag in a one-on-one -on -one vote so that people, a majority would definitely be happy with the decision. Okay, so, so we had the good news with May's theorem. Let's have, look at the bad news if there are more than two candidates. So we want every voter, um, if every single voter prefers candidate X to candidate Y, the, the voting system must say X is better than Y. That's if every, every single voter agrees, then we must have that in the output. Um, and now the second condition, independence of irrelevant alternatives, if X is ranked, if, if the sy voting system says X is better than Y, and then some other candidate Z, that's not X or Y, some other candidate becomes more popular, then X is better than Y can't change. So, so you know, suppose you're choosing a candidate for a job, and you say, yeah, well, I think the first candidate was definitely better than the second candidate, like we're agreed on that, and then a third candidate comes along who, he doesn't tell you anything about candidates one and two, and you say, actually, now I've seen candidate three, I think candidate two is better than candidate one. Like this extra information that doesn't tell you anything about the first two candidates shouldn't affect your, um, your opinion of them. And there should be no dictator, so there shouldn't just be a single voter who says, oh, well, if I'm going, I vote, whichever way I vote, that's the way the election will go. So there's no pre-specified person who, they're, they're the only vote that counts. So no, there's no system that satisfies these three conditions. Um, and the most commonly unsatisfied condition is the second one, independence of irrelevant alternatives. Um, so let's have a look at that in first past the post. So suppose um, you've got these preferences. So there's 110 people who like X, Z, Y, 102 like Y, X, Z, and eight people like Z, X, Y. Suppose nine people change their preference from the first one to the third one. Um, then Y would win. Y is still as unliked as before. People still say anyone would be better than Y. I'd prefer X to Y, I'd prefer Z to Y, anyone but Y. But because some people say actually, yeah, maybe Z is the better of X and, X and Z. Now, now, I li now I wins. So this violates independence of relevant alternatives and also violates the majority loser criterion. So you can elect unpopular candidates. You can elect candidates who say, um, yeah, a majority of people say anyone but this candidate and they can still win. So let's have a look at the alternative vote. So some definite, so just quick definition of it. Um, the voters rank their candidates rather than just putting a first preference. You count up the first preferences. If someone has a majority, then they immediately win. Otherwise, whoever has the fewest votes gets knocked out and their, their second preferences turn into first preferences. And then you just repeat it until someone has a majority and they win. Um, so this one, wait. Oh, yeah, sorry, I missed this one. Um, okay. Um, so <laughs> the problem with first past the post is that you can have these clones. So if two candidates are kind of ranked next to each other, like X and Z are, then um, they harm each other because they split the vote. Um, so if you want to win a first past the post election, just clone your opponent. Just make, just make a candidate that's really similar to them. So AV is clone proof. If you have two candidates who are ranked, who are always ranked next to each other, people say, yeah, these two candidates are roughly the same. If, if one of them didn't run, it wouldn't make any difference to the, to the other candidates. So that's guaranteed mathematically. It also satisfies majority loser criterion. So if as one candidate, more than half the people say anyone but that candidate, then they can't win. Um, so, is AV just a better system? No. So, suppose that we have an election and X gets some ranking, let's say X wins, and then the electorate change and they say, actually, we, we like X even more now, and we have the second election, where X is, X is you know, let's say X wins the first election, then X serves their term, and then they're even more popular next time around. That shouldn't hurt X, X should just win again, right? Um, but AV isn't monotone, it, that's, that's a monotone condition. AV isn't monotone. If a candidate becomes more popular, it can actually harm them, which is a particular vulnerable, well, AV has this problem, um, first past the post doesn't. Um, so let's give an example. So in the first vote, um, we have 
W has nine votes, X has six, Y has six, and Z has five. So Z is knocked out. Um, and then what W has nine votes, X has 11, and Y has six. So Y goes out, Y's votes get sent to X. And so in the final result, W has nine and X has 17. So X would win that vote. So that's the first election. Then suppose the voters change to voters prime with the apostrophe. Um, so now in the first round, Y is the least popular candidate rather than Z. So Y is eliminated first. Y's second votes go to Z. So now it's W has nine, X has eight, and Z has nine. So X gets knocked out in the second round. So now, and their votes transfer to Z. So a Z wins with a majority now to, to um, the same majority as X had before. So X lost by becoming more popular in this case. Um, yep. And also doesn't satisfy the participation criterion. So you can be in the situation where you, uh, you get a better outcome for yourself if you don't vote at all. So let's say there's kind of three, there's three, this um, Tennessee is choosing a new state capital and people want to be near to the capital as possible and live in the capital if they can. So there's three kind of cities on one side and Memphis, which is right in the bottom corner, but is the most populous. So we've got Memphis's majority loser. There's the three other cities would rather have anyone but Memphis because they're all closer to each other. So straight away, well, to me, it seems obvious that Nashville is the kind of compromise winner. It should, should be the compromise winner here. Um, because it's kind of in the middle and it has a fair amount of support on its own anyway. But the problem is um, that Memphis voters, because they're popular, but not quite popular, not unpopular enough to get knocked out, their votes never get reassigned. They're, they're on 42%, so they're not going to be eliminated. So what happens is Chattanooga voters get knocked out, their votes go to Knoxville, Nashville voters Nashville is then the least popular. Their votes get knocked out. They go to Knoxville. So Knoxville wins. Knoxville, Knoxville wins here, even though it's clearly kind of the extreme candidate um, at the right-hand side, away from everything else. Um, yeah, so, um, it, so what, what, could, what could we have done differently? Well, if Memphis voters, if the figure had been 25% uh, of original voters rather than 42 if that, if that was what Memphis, if people had stopped, if fewer people had voted from Memphis, they would have been knocked out and their votes would have gone to Nashville and Nashville would have won. So you can actually, so people who vote from Memphis, who voted for Memphis, harmed their own interests because if fewer of them had voted, that a better candidate for them would have won. Um, yeah, so basically with two options, you do have a very good voting system, just choose your favorite. Um, but with three or more candidates, things immediately get messy. Um, these are two fairly straightforward to understand systems, um, but they both have like very undesirable properties about them. Um, so that, as I was saying before, we don't like to use the sort of non-specific language, but there's no, with Arrow's theorem, if you consider that to be a fair system, then Arrow's theorem shows that there's no fair system. Um, and that's kind of a big, uh, I don't know, problem. Maybe you think it's not a problem with democracy. Um, I don't know. Uh, so you used to decide. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, we've got about five minutes for questions, and I can see I've got a question over there. So thanks very much. Something that I think I guess is quite important is there's a difference between this voting system is massively and obviously flawed in everyday situations and it's possible to come up with a right, very right. complicated corner case where this system yeah. fails. So is there a way of quantifying that or quantifying how regularly these failure modes occur in real elections as opposed to in theory the system can produce this ridiculous result, but it never actually does. Yeah, that's a very good question, thank you. Um, so some people, one estimate for if we applied 
uh, alternative vote to UK elections was that it would hardly ever happen, that the uh, monotone criterion would, hold, would, have, would fail, that people would have been better uh, voting differently. Um, I think that that made quite specific assumptions about how voters would choose the parties in the future. It's really difficult to make uh, inference about whether this ever does happen because people can't release the whole ranking of candidates. So if you, if you, for example, in Australia, they use AV, but there's no list of here's what everyone voted for. Because, you, you, because someone could say, right, um, you know, I want you to list, there's 20 candidates, list them in this order so that I know that you've done as I've said. So we only have information about what was the first count, what was the second count, and so on. Um, so it's really difficult to know whether this does happen with practical systems. Um, it's, yeah, I, I mean, the thing with first past the post, you also have majority loser thing, which but the thing is that most people know that that's a thing. They know that, oh, if, well, if I vote for the candidate I really like, I might be harming the candidate that I do, the worst, the, you know, better of two evils. Um, so people sometimes do vote tactically based on that as well. Um, they know that that's a problem and try to get around it. Does any of that change with multi-member systems where there's more than one winner? Sorry, what was the first bit? Uh, multi, uh, does it change with multi-member systems where there's more than one winner? Um, I, so our theorem only applies to a single candidate. Um, you can single winner election. You still, I, d I think it, I'm not 100% sure, I think it still applies um, to multi, but I'm not 100% I'm not sure on that. Um, yeah. Uh, have, what, what's your opinion on concordance voting systems? Um, what, what about them? It's in... I know they're computationally right. kind of intensive and it's obviously very difficult for a lot of people to understand how they work and the more things that are involved, the heavier the computation gets. But mm. is it possible to actually fix that with more technology and better algorithms? Um, yeah, so more complex algorithms for doing voting systems do exist, as you're saying, that the problem is that you have, um, you would need to conduct the election on voting machines, which I guess some people don't like. And also um, people, the, the advantage of something like first past the post is that everyone understands how, how the votes are counted. Um, whereas with something that's much smart, kind of a smarter system, um, people don't really understand it as much. Um, I think, yeah, if I was, if we were doing it again, if we're starting the whole democracy again, we probably would have um, a smarter system that had fewer disadvantages, but we need to sort of educate everyone right at the beginning about exactly why this was a better system. Um, uh, sorry, does that, does that answer the question? I'm, not sure. <laughs> okay. Is there any way to check whether a system would be liable to um, tactical voting? Um, so there is a theorem, um, I can't remember the name of it, but it's kind of similar to, um, kind of similar to Arrow's theorem that says if everyone has knowledge about what other people are voting, then every system is vulnerable to tactical voting. Uh, is it? Um, can we thank the speaker again?